a show about nature's lessons coming up right after this. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. Now in today's show, we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna take a look at some of nature's bounty, some of the interesting and beautiful things that we can find, well, out on a woodland walk. And we're actually going to put it together. It's a great children's project. Now there's some other things that we're gonna talk about as well. I'd like for you to take a trip with me to New Jersey to visit a butterfly house that's used to teach kids all about butterflies and the plants they need to survive. We'll also go to Michigan and learn more about some colorful plants that add beauty to the garden throughout the seasons. And I also want you to take a look at what I'm working on in my garden. And finally, we'll answer a viewer's question, and I want you to try this delicious spinach and strawberry salad. It's all coming up, so stay tuned. If you're like me, you find butterflies not only beautiful, but equally fascinating to watch. Jeff Hoagland is the education director of the Stony Brook Watershed Association. It's in New Jersey, and he tells us all about the Katie Gorey Butterfly House. This is really essentially a living museum for butterflies and native plants, a place for families and children and adults to come and enjoy the world of nature up close. Everybody loves butterflies. It's really relatively easy to attract them. The first place to start is with nectar sources, flowers. We find a variety of nectar sources. We've got a lot of rutabecchia or black-eyed Susans. There's some cardinal flower in bloom. There's also Joe Pieweed about to bloom. Uh, and of course, one of our favorites is milkweed. Blazing Star is in bloom as well. And we have a couple of shrubs that are blooming as well. One is called button bush. We also have sweet pepper bush. We also have plants in here that were chosen to provide food for the larvae of some of the common native butterflies. Certainly one of the easiest to, to try out at home is planting milkweed for the monarch butterfly. If you're growing milkweed, you'll not only see a variety of butterflies sipping on nectar, you may see monarchs visiting and laying eggs. Um, you'll have to look carefully, typically on the underside of the leaves for, for eggs, um, and look for chewed leaves, which will often indicate the presence of monarch larvae. Um, the, the, the banded caterpillars. But we have other guests as well. We have tortoise beetles visiting plants. This garden is an education tool. It's, it's an opportunity for kids to get involved. They're discovering new plants, they're discovering new flowers, they're discovering new bugs, other residents of, of the spaces that surround us. It's that connection with the natural world, with the plants that we share space with, that give us fresh air, with the organisms that are our neighbors, that is vital to the kids today because this is where they start to develop an environmental ethic. It's a celebration of butterflies, it's a celebration of gardens um, and native plants, and it's a reminder that we used to have a much more intimate life with the world of nature and that it's there waiting for all of us. After the break, we'll get started on that simple project, so stay tuned. Just take a look at this basket of bloom. Isn't it gorgeous? There's several different annuals at work here. This beautiful orange diasica called Flying Colors Coral. It's by Proven Winners, as well as all of these, actually. This is a beautiful little calabrocoa, the pale yellow. And then this is a sweet potato vine with a much smaller leaf on it. And I just love this super tunia. This one's called Royal Velvet. And it creates such a dark contrast to all these lighter colored flowers. Now, this container represents what would be beautiful for, let's say, a summer planting, perhaps around a pool. Shanna Clark from Four Star Nursery in Michigan gives us some more ideas about adding beautiful flowers and color to our gardens. Something I like to do in my garden is change color with the seasons. This here is a great springtime combination. In the center you've got your baby tuck grass, you've got Supertunia Bermuda Beach, which is a nice pastel pink color, and my favorite is the Superbells Yellow Chiffon. The nice light pastel yellow is great for early spring combinations, and you can also mix it in with blues and purples. It has a great mounded trailing habit, and it works well in this combination here, and also in window boxes. 
For the summertime, I love hot colors. We've got the Lantana Luscious Citrus Blend here, which has a lot of vibrant colors in the red, orange, and yellow tones. And it's also amazingly drought and heat tolerant. It'll take it next to the driveway, by the sidewalk, any place where it's really, really hot. And the other great thing about the Lantana Luscious Citrus Blend is that it attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. A great choice plant for fall is the Supertunia Royal Velvet. It works great in containers and in the landscape and its nice dark purple foliage mixes well with other bright colors. Uh, the mounded habit of it is great for a lot of different uses in the garden and it works well in combinations with bright colors such as the Hookera Dolce Key Lime Pie. It has stunning chartreuse foliage and a mounded upright habit so you can do it in the center of your containers or as a border in the landscape. The key lime pie is also a perennial plant, so it'll last you through the fall season, into the winter, and for many more years to come. By updating our plants and gardens as the seasons progress, that way we're always sure that our colors match our seasons. This is a really simple project that gets kids involved in gathering up things from nature and really taking the time to look at the individual beauty of things that we can find along a woodland walk or in the backyard. For instance, moss and sticks and pebbles and all sorts of things. Anything goes with this project. Now, all you really need, we're making a picture frame, by the way, and all you really need is a cardboard uh, square or rectangle, any shape you like or dimension, and what you do is just cut out the size of the photograph that you think might go in this. And then take the other side and just really have some fun. I like to first border it with sticks, as you can see here, just using some simple craft glue. And then on this one, I'm going to apply some moss around it. And you can see I've just been sort of pinning it down with the glue like this. And here's where the imagination can kind of take over. You can use pebbles and all sorts of things, uh, even these sweet gumballs or uh, dried leaves. I love this old press that I bought years ago in a yard sale, and I use it every fall to gather up leaves and press them. So these become ideal for a project like this. You could just lay them across and, and, and come up with all sorts of shapes and designs. It's a beautiful way to showcase elements from nature as well as showcase a special photograph. So give it a try. Now when we return, I'll meet you in the garden and show you what I'm doing to give my tomatoes a little support. So stay with us. Before the break, let's take a look at one more plant for bringing color into the garden. Now this little nemesia is not new. It's one called Bluebird. It's been around a while, but it's worth mentioning because it's still one of the best you can grow. Although it can stand up to heat better than some, the quality that I rely on is frost tolerance, so it's ideal for the early spring garden. Bluebird has a snapdragon-shaped blue to purple flower that mixes beautifully with other cool season favorites, such as violas, ornamental kale, and pansies. Boy, I can't tell you how helpful it is to have the right equipment when you're doing a job, and I have got a job out here today. You see, what I'm doing is I'm setting posts for my tomatoes. Now, you may say, now why are you putting your post in after your tomatoes are planted? Well, we've had so much rain, it was more important for me to get the plants out when I had a good day to work the ground, and then come back later and set the post. So what I'm doing is I'm using this auger, which is really handy, and I've got a five inch diameter auger on it. You can see it. And that's perfect for these four by four posts. Now placed in this hole, those are gonna stand about five feet tall, which will allow me to run three to four wires along this entire row. Now, if you use power equipment, you need to make sure that you follow the instruction manual and certainly wear all the protective gear that goes along with it. Now this is a gas powered uh, auger, which is mighty handy, and particularly given the number of posts that I have to set out. You see what we have are uh, a series of 60 foot rows here, and I'm placing these posts about 20 feet apart. And that should give these tomatoes enough uh, support because in years past, I have not been able to stake them. And what happens is they fall all over the ground. 
You know, there's a division between tomatoes, between whether they're determinate or indeterminate. A determinate tomato will grow a certain height. An indeterminate, well, just as the name implies, will grow everywhere. So this staking system will allow me to get those uh, unwieldy vines in place. The other thing, if you're growing tomatoes, you need to remember is try to choose varieties that work in your area. For instance, in this row, I have planted uh, the, the Bonnie Hybrid number 444, also called Southern Star. It's really great because it seems to be resistant to spotted wilt virus. So these are things to keep in mind when you're selecting your tomatoes. Now, the way I'm gonna set these posts, I'm just gonna drop them in the ground about 18 inches. That's plenty to get past this really loose soil and get down into some of the hard pan. And then I'm going to take rocks, and believe me, there are plenty of rocks out here in the garden, and I'm gonna drop them around the post and use a tamp and tamp them in and just put some soil around it. Now, what this will allow me to do is I can take these posts up and the wire at the end of the season, and I can use them on the other side of the garden. The reason you do that with tomatoes or any plant in the nightshade family, such as eggplant and peppers and potatoes, you wanna rotate the crop each year. And so this year the tomatoes are on this side, next year the tomatoes will be on that side. I wanna stay one step ahead of disease. I really enjoy this part of the show. It's where I take questions from you, the viewer, and we talk about them here on the show. Now, this question comes from Ashley in California. She says, Alan, I have an area in my backyard that receives full sun, and I'd like to plant multiple vegetables. The problem is I don't have a lot of space. Is there a technique or techniques that I could use uh, in my limited area? Well, Ashley, actually, there are some things you can think about. One is I love to do raised beds, as you may know, with nutrient-rich soil, so that'll put you in good stead to produce a lot of vegetables. Now, mixing them together is really a very old concept, one called intercropping. In fact, uh, one example comes from the Americas, where native Indians used to plant um, corn and squash and beans together. And I've been doing this in my garden. Let me give you some examples. For instance, I've planted tomatoes, lettuce, beans, and peas growing in the same area. I planted red tails lettuce as a ground cover this spring and snap peas as the vertical growing plant. You see, I'm making use of space. I'm growing on the vertical. Once it got a little warmer, I planted husky tomatoes in between my snap peas. When the snap peas are harvested and done, the tomatoes will have plenty of room to grow up the trellis. Also, since I planted the lettuce in the early spring, I was able to plant bush beans in this spot as well. You see, there are many different combinations that you can try. Now, Ashley, one other thing to think about is using interesting containers. For instance, I use bushel and half bushel baskets to grow things such as potatoes. You're growing them above ground and sitting on top of the bed. It's a great space-saving way to grow things. So as you can see, there are lots of different combinations of vegetables that can coexist and perform beautifully. You just need to figure out the season and which ones are compatible. And then the other tip, of course, is to get creative in the containers that you use. Ashley, I hope this helps. Good luck with your summer garden. Okay, now after the break, I'll show you how to make this delicious recipe, so stay tuned. I want to tell you about a delicious spring recipe for a salad. It takes some of the best of the garden that a friend gave me. It's really, really good. Now, what it uses is fresh spinach, arugula, and strawberries. Now, who doesn't love strawberries? And what I've done here is I've just um, uh, pureed the strawberries, uh, the juice, and made it rather frothy and um, in the food processor, and I've just pulsed it several times. Now, what I like about this is that it's all in season. Um, we always grow spinach, not only in the spring, but in the fall here, it likes cool weather. The strawberries, we grow two different kinds, one called Cardinal and the other one called Ozark, and just talking about them makes my mouth water. And then, of course, arugula, sometimes called Rocket, has that marvelous sort of uh, oak-like leaf to it and shape, but that uh, almost spicy green that, again, is so easy to grow directly from seed, um, it'll come up in no time. I think that's the reason they call it rocket. And the spinach, too, is very easy to, to grow from seed. Now, the strawberries, you'll want to plant the strawberries from plants. That's what we do here. 
Now what I've done here is uh, in the food processor, I just took three or four of these ripe berries, capped, and I threw them in there with a fourth of a cup of this uh, red wine vinegar and a fourth of a cup of honey. And I put it in the food processor and then it yields this, which is a, a almost a, a nectar, it's fabulous. Now what I'm gonna add to it now will be um, the olive oil here, which is a fourth of a cup of olive oil for the dressing. So we'll get this out of the way. This is so simple to do and it's so good. And so what I'm gonna do is make sure the oil and that lovely strawberry red wine vinegar and honey all blended together, see that? Isn't that great? Okay, that's the dressing. Now look, this is really simple. Like I said, four cups here of spinach and then one cup each of sliced strawberries, um, the arugula, and one cup of, of pecan. And then you're just gonna add salt and pepper to taste. So now you, all you do is combine it. And what I like to do is start with the arugula first. Um, so I just put the greens on top of greens like this. And then I'll take the strawberries next and just decorate the top of it, e distributing them evenly like this, then one cup of, of toasted chopped pecans, locally grown from around here, which I love. So look at that. Now, we're ready for the dressing. Now, I don't typically put the dressing on until we're ready to sit down and have it, so I'm gonna hold off on that, because it makes everything soggy and I like it all very fresh. Now, you can add uh, roasted chicken to this, uh, which will make it an entree salad, and I highly recommend it. It's very good, particularly if you can use one of those delicious heritage chickens. They taste so good. Anyway, look at that. It's just beautiful, a great way to celebrate spring. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Now remember, if you want that recipe, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. And remember, all the information in today's show is there. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream Of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh, no, I can't help but smile.